Hello and welcome to Round Table. Russia and the West have found a new freezing cold arena in which to play out their geopolitical tensions, the Arctic. Wary of rising Russian military activity in the region, the United States recently announced it will appoint its first ever ambassador at large for the Arctic. NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has also expressed concern over Russia and China's strategic ambitions there. Is the Arctic, in every sense, the site for a new Cold War? Good to have you along. I'm David Foster. With ice caps rapidly melting from climate change, new shipping lanes across the roof of the world are providing shorter maritime routes and more opportunities for energy extraction. China, whose presence in the Arctic has steadily increased over recent years, aims to take advantage of this by creating a, quote, polar silk road. But interest in the Arctic isn't just economic. In recent weeks, the Russian Pacific Fleet launched several missiles in the Arctic Ocean, an example of ongoing militarization in the region. So, how is the West responding to Russian and Chinese Arctic ambitions? And what do those from the region actually think? Well, joining us out of Brussels, we have Marianne Konix, former EU ambassador at large for the Arctic. In fact, the very first EU ambassador in such a role. In Helsinki, we have Petteri Grumaki, Finland's ambassador for Arctic affairs and senior Arctics official. In Washington, D.C., Rebecca Pincus, director of the Wilson Center's Polar Institute. Rebecca, if it's not inappropriate to say it, how hot are things getting up there politically and militarily? The Arctic is certainly hot right now. Um, we do hear that fairly often. As you can imagine, the confluence of the lowest point in tensions between Russia and the West in decades uh, in combination with the rapid advancing of climate change in the region means that there is just a ton of interest in the Arctic region right now. And you know, that plus sort of broader scale interests in critical minerals, um, in growing Chinese influence in the region. You know, it's it's a laundry list of um, reasons to be looking north. Do we have two possible reasons to be particularly concerned? One is, as you mentioned, the, the, the mineral wealth, the exploitation that um, so many people want to benefit from up there, but also the possibility of, of mistakes. Sure. You know, when we think about the green transition, and obviously that's gained a lot of traction and urgency in the last six months, um, we're going to need to massively expand production of rare earth minerals and other minerals that are critical to the green transition. And many of those are found in the Arctic region, where there's a lot of untapped resources. And so there's a lot of interest in tapping in there. Um, that obviously raises a lot of questions when we think about the resources found on Russian territory. Um, but we also are in an unprecedented um, global situation with the sanctions regime. And that's causing a lot of churn in markets, in supply chains, in investment pathways. And so I think there's a lot yet to be seen about the future of resource development in the North. Pateri, your country is a member of the Arctic Council. You're active in that. Let's run through what it is. It came about after the Cold War, partly to include Russia in any discussions about the region. It's got the USA, Canada, Denmark. Denmark, which runs Greenland. It's got Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden and Russia. But there are treaties governing what happens that far north. But militarization and conflict don't feature that much, particularly now that Russia's been suspended. Um, how delicate are things within the Arctic Council, Pateri? Well, thanks, David. Thanks for the invitation. The, um, I, I think the issues pertaining to the Arctic are always uh, delicate. It's, it's a delicate, vulnerable uh, region. Um, the Arctic Council celebrated its 25th anniversary last um, um, May, um, and it continues to be the preeminent uh, forum for um, circumpolar um, uh, cooperation. The, we're living uh, dark and depressing times um, for someone like myself, who spent a lifetime on, on cooperation side of things. Um, Russia has not been suspended from the Arctic Council. There are eight permanent members of the Arctic Council. 
and we sit together with the permanent um, uh, participants, the indigenous peoples, who are very, very important uh, in Arctic cooperation. So when I said suspended, uh, I was wrong, but there have been some kind of sanctions, if you like, um, put in place regards Russia on the Arctic Council? Well, we decided, um, following the atrocities, that should leave no one with a heart indifferent to the atroc atrocities in Ukraine, we, the, 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 the seven um, other members of the Arctic Council, we decided very, very early in, in March that we would not uh, be taking part um, in the Arctic Council um, activities. And then later on in, in June, we decided on the partial resumption on, on, on some of the, um, quite a few of the projects where, where Russia has not been uh, involved um, in. So it's, um, um, it, it's a challenging situation. Um, but we look forward to an orderly transfer of, of the chairmanship from the Russian Federation to Norway uh, uh, next uh, spring, as has been. And are you addressing any of the issues that we're talking about here? Um, countries perhaps bullying their way into getting mineral resources that they feel are necessary, um, the increasing militarization of the area, the possibility of conflict, or do you stay well aware, well away from that? Well, the Arctic Council is an interesting international body. To my knowledge, it's the only international body whose founding um, document uh, stipulates what it cannot discuss. And the Arctic Council is not to discuss matters of, of military uh, security. The, um, the number one priority uh, is the, the climate change, um, the, prior, the, the biodiversity, um, sustainable development of the region, and uh, the, uh, the indigenous peoples, their, their, their culture, uh, traditional um, livelihoods. But if, if um, I may say so, all of those things that you list there are threatened by military activity. So why not include that? Do you, do you not feel a little bit useless? No, we don't feel useless um, at, at all. The Arctic is warming four times faster than the rest of the world. I think the Barents Sea is, is, is warming six times and Svalbard even seven times faster than the rest of the world. That's an immense danger that calls for uh, um, uh, cooperation. Um, so I can't see how we could possibly be uh, referred to. As no, no, I, I, in, in I terms of the bigger effect. picture, I totally understand not useless, but I meant useless in terms of making sure that there is no increasing militarization or the possibility of conflict in that area. There's nothing you can do. Well, I mean, the, the Arctic Council is not the whole picture. I mean, obviously, um, matters pertaining to hard security will achieve attain more attention following the uh, changes in the, in the security policy um, in environment. Um, uh, but that is not for the Arctic Council to consider those uh, particular uh, issues. Um, uh, Finland is engaged in active security policy dialogue on, 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 uh, with its partners. Um, um, and the, the Finnish and Swedish um, uh, desire to join the uh, North Atlantic uh, um, um, alliance uh, is, is a one indication of our determination to actually provide uh, security. Uh, we have strong uh, defense system, we're resilient um, um, uh, societies, and we'll be able to make a contribution in that regard as well. But the important thing is that the security does, does not overshadow importance of the climate change, the people in the Arctic and the sustainable development. Shall we hear from Jens Stoltenberg, because he's addressing the, the military concerns. He was in Canada uh, last month talking about the military concerns that uh, NATO and other countries indeed have. And I'll come to you after that, Amri. NATO's new strategic concept identifies Russia's capabilities in the high north uh, as a strategic challenge for the whole alliance. Russia has set up uh, a new Arctic command. It has opened hundreds of new and former Soviet-era Arctic uh, military sites, including airfields and deep water ports. Russia is also using the region as a testbed for many of its new uh, novel weapon systems. What kind of challenge is it, Amory, would you say? Uh, I would say this is a serious uh, challenge, a security challenge uh, for uh, Europe in included, um, because the Arctic has a 
uh, geopolitical strategic importance is not immune for what is happening outside. Already in 2014 with Ukraine, there was a spillover from the conflict to the Arctic. And now we see, as you mentioned yourself, we have an increase of militarization. And uh, uh, Russia is demonstrated that it's still a big power by increasing that militarization. And this is a security threat. If you look at the situation of the European Union, the European Arctic is one of the four regions where Europe meets Russia. The other three regions are the Baltic State, the Black Sea, uh, and Ukraine, and, uh, and uh, uh, Belarus, which means that um, we have to treat the European Arctic the same way as we also consider security threats for the other four regions. So it is really, an, an, uh, it is a security threat. And I'm very, very pleased that finally uh, the NATO got more awareness for the security threats in, in the Arctic. Well, I, let, let me run through some of the things that has been happening up there. And then you can tell me when you, when you say more awareness, what it is actually doing, uh, rather than just saying it's, it's worried. Um, this is just this year. At the start of 2022, Russia started Navy drills designed to assess troops' combat readiness in the Arctic. Somebody want, may want to address how ready they actually are. In March, US and Canada announced military exercises up there. Two months later, Arctic Council members, Sweden and Finland, you've already mentioned this, applied to join NATO after Russia invades Ukraine. In August, the US Senate proposed a bill to increase military presence in the Arctic as a direct response to Russia's increasing assertiveness, as some saw it. And just two weeks ago, Russia and its submarines fired cruise missiles up there. What is NATO actually doing, Anne-Marie? Yeah. I, what I stressed before is that um, until this Big Bang and this Russian invasion in Ukraine, NATO was not very aware of the Arctic. They did not really want to deal with the Arctic. Uh, Already in 2014, when there was following the uh, Russian invasion of Crimea, there was an increase of militarization uh, in Russia itself, but there was a soft reaction or no reaction from NATO itself. And now we had the Big Bang. And finally, I think that NATO woke up. It's not anymore sleepwalking. But, but, but in, in, in what sense is it woken up? What is it actually doing other than the US sending an ambassador at large, presumably, to go wherever uh, he or she I wants think to go. That it, it brought the, the NATO countries much more together. Uh, they have a strategy in which, for the first time, the strategy decided in June at the Mid Madrid summit, for the first time, they mentioned the Arctic as strategic important uh, region. We had an immediate effect. We have Finland and Sweden uh, applying to join uh, NATO, and then, therefore, Every Arctic state will be much more stronger if it's part of NATO than without it. So for the moment, I think that uh, NATO is showing its strength. It should not be accelerating, I would say, escalating uh, the situation that there is. But as Russia is putting up uh, its military uh, presence and, and showing its deterrence, I think that NATO is, is doing the same by staying together, by even increasing its membership and uh, being ready in case, and we hope there will be no uh, military conflict in the Arctic. Rebecca, this isn't the first time we've discussed this on, on this programme, but obviously things have reached a, a, a new level. I wonder if you think there will be war in the Arctic? I hope not, and I don't think so. I think we are clearly in an unprecedented situation in Europe with land war in Ukraine at a level of brutality that we haven't seen in decades. And that is an awful and shocking turn of events. And, you know, clearly Russia is an Arctic power. You just need to look at a map and they have significant military capabilities there. But there is no need for war to come to the Arctic and I think if the nations, the Arctic nations, um, Arctic adjacent nations are careful, it won't. Um, we certainly need to recognize this is a highly sensitive situation. And so when it comes to military exercises, a great de deal of care should be taken to ensure that nothing goes wrong. Because I think in this very tense situation, 
an accident, an unintended escalation could go wrong very quickly. But I believe that NATO allies are being extremely careful right now. I believe they're cooperating at a level that we haven't seen, you know, perhaps ever, um, certainly not in many, many years. Mm. And that's fantastic. And I think that should keep up. But Terry talked about the fact that uh, we're seeing an awful lot more economic activity up there. And there are concerns because of global warming, which you also referenced. And that makes the shipping lanes that much wider and it more important for various countries to, to be able to use them to get their goods backwards and forwards. Let's run through um, some of what is driving the global competition. Uh, it's thought, what, about 13% of the world's undiscovered conventional oil and 30% of the world's undiscovered conventional gas are in the Arctic. When I say conventional, I mean excluding things like fracking and shale. And the region has over a trillion dollars worth of precious metals and minerals. So, Rebecca, and then on to you in a moment, Pateri. When China declare, declares itself a near-Arctic state, which it patently isn't if we take a look at that map again, it's only the countries that are bordering the Arctic that can be an Arctic state. Um, when it says that, what is it actually saying to the rest of the world? You know, it's well, not about geographic proximity. Have... I think it's clear that, you know, China has economic interests in the region because it's a resource, a raw material importing country. And there's a lot of raw materials and resources in the Arctic region. And so it's not surprising that um, Chinese investors are interested in the region. Um, just as we see Chinese investment around the world, particularly in places where, um, if there's perhaps uh, emerging markets or um, areas where governance is developing or in flux, perhaps. But if so China, think... there are two questions here, sorry to interrupt, but if, if China were to go it alone, would that be possible? Or would it have to form no. alliances with other Arctic bordering it, countries? China has no Arctic territory. So, of course, it's going to need to have partners. And it comes and would that be any other nation? Footing. Would that be any other nation besides Russia? We saw a significant level of Chinese investment interest in the Arctic region in sort of throughout the 2010s. And then, you know, I would say about five years ago or so, four or five years ago, there was a lot of global pushback against the concept of sort of debt trap diplomacy. And we saw the damaging potential impacts of Chinese investment in places around the world. And so since then, I think the nations of the world, including in the Arctic, have really woken up to the potential dangers associated with Chinese investment. And in the last couple of years, we've seen potential Chinese investments in the Arctic in places like Finland and Canada be rejected. So I think at this point, Chinese investment, particularly in critical infrastructure, critical resources, is getting a high level of scrutiny around well, the let, Arctic, let's ask with, of course, the major exception of Russia. Let, so let's talk ask about Pateri well. about that, because Rebecca's just talked about the fact that your country rejected Chinese investment. What was it, what was it after and why did you say no? Well, I mean, that, that was based on, on, on national um, uh, considerations. Uh, let me just um, add to the point of the near Arctic states, the fact that there are eight Arctic states, there are not seven um, or um, nine. Um, there are eight um, of us uh, constituting uh, the, the Arctic Council and, and um, Arctic states. China is not the only country interested in the Arctic. There are a huge number of countries around the world um, in Europe and, and beyond and, and in Asia who have manifested a keen interest for the Arctic uh, from different perspectives, uh, be it for the economic possibilities or, or for science or for, uh, for, for climate change, um, um, etc. The, the Arctic Council, and like I keep referring to the Arctic Council since I represent my country in the Arctic Council, there's currently 38 observers uh, organizations and countries and, and, and great many more entities and, and countries have expressed the, de the desire to become an observer. Um, China um, is one of the observers uh, of, of the Arctic Council and that cooperation has been um, um, constructed. But can, can I say, Pateri, because you, you've referenced climate change and your concerns about the ecological impact of many of the things that are happening up there, would it be fair to say that and Rebecca said she hopes there'll be no war, but she believes there won't be war, that your real worries are about the commercial exploitation and the damage that could cause rather than possible conflict? You tell me. 
Well, I, I, I spent my days being worried about the, uh, the speed of, of climate change. I continue be, to be worried uh, for the loss of biodiversity and for the general welfare of the people in the circumpolar Arctic uh, living in, in very difficult um, conditions, particularly the indigenous peoples. Um, the, the region is the focus of international attention. Um, and I've been trying to underline that, that, that there should not only be a focus on security, there should not only be a, a focus on the economic possibilities, but one has to see the the full complete picture of Arctic realities and, and Arctic cooperation and find at times very delicate uh, balances uh, between these um, aspirations. Uh, Marie, I know you believe the Arctic Council is as important as it's ever been, but it's not very inclusive. What, what are the problems it needs to deal with to, to arrest some of the issues that may be gathering pace? I think that the Arctic Council, as Peter he has uh, said, is uh, a very, very important body uh, of governance of the Arctic uh, itself and has achieved a lot. But the Arctic Council is not the only body or, or international organizations that does positive things which are positive for the Arctic. For example, if European Union and others are working to combat climate change, uh, this is also will have a result also for the Arctic. Uh, another example is uh, what Peter has mentioned. It's extremely important that if we are going to have economic development in the Arctic, it has to be done in a sustainable way because of the so fragile environment that's taking uh, place. So the Arctic Council has done a lot of work, but it's not an, uh, the only unique body uh, doing it. And there is a lot, a lot of cooperation regarding the Arctic that it's going on outside uh, the Arctic. And there I have a little, and Peter noted very well, a critic to the Arctic Council that is a very, it's a very uh, exclusive uh, club that although it has observers, the observers have not a big role to play, except when they work in the working groups and pay projects. But for the rest, their voice is really limited. And therefore, I think the Arctic Council would be better off to be more inclusive and to have a bigger voice for observers as well. When the US State Department, Rebecca, says this, an Arctic region that is peaceful, stable, prosperous and cooperative is of critical strategic importance to the United States, what does it mean and how important is it that the United States has now taken this extra step by appointing an ambassador at large for the Arctic, even though we don't know that person's name? I think the forthcoming ambassadorship is a fantastic demonstration of the administration's interest in the region. Um, so, you know, bravo, can't wait to find out who it is. Um, but, you know, when we sort of place this in the broader context, we know from statements by the administration, statements from the Department of Defense, that, uh, and this is something where, um, you know, there is a rare bipartisan consensus in the United States that the U.S.'s most significant competitor is China, and the most important theater of competition is the Indo-Pacific. And obviously this year, Europe has become, you know, it's a neck and neck competition. So, you know, Indo-Pacific and Europe are the top two priorities for the administration for the United States. And again, there's bipartisan consensus there, which means that for the U.S., the Arctic is not a top priority because we have these two urgent... But um, it would be jolly easy, wouldn't it, if things got out of hand, let's say, in, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, Belarus, wherever, in Latvia, Lithuania, it would be jolly easy then for the Russians to fire a missile from their territory straight across the Arctic Circle into Canada, possibly even the United States, East or West Coast. But why would they do that? What possible benefit would Russia derive from targeting the US or Canada? I mean, it would be... I don't understand why Russia would do that. It's a suicide mission. Well, that may be what he's intent on at this particular moment. That's that's a question which we've asked on this program many, many times. But, Amory, just a quick one from you before we go. You think, do you, that peace can prevail in the Arctic or are we very close to seeing things boil over if there's the slightest miscalculation? 
I participated at a conference lately where the title was uh, High Note, High Tension. And I think that reflects very well the current situation. I heard what Rebecca said, uh, but uh, we are dealing with an extremely unpredictable uh, player for the moment who wants war at any price, even if it would be against its own uh, strategic interest. For Russia, the Arctic is a strategic interest, so I don't see that if it gets worse, that the Arctic might be an exception for Russia. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, as we've heard from Vladimir Putin in the past, a world that does not accept Russia on Russia's terms is not a world that he considers is worth living in. Um, thank you. May you remain an optimist, all of you. Thank you very much indeed for coming on Roundtable, and thank you wherever you're watching this edition of Roundtable. Until next time, from me, David Foster, goodbye.